Good morning to everyone. We are here with uh, Gustavo, Gustavo Adrian De Feo, to, uh, to talk about uh, transparency in the composition of materials uh, and uh, in particular on the radiocarbon uh, measurement uh, that is uh, a very interesting application uh, in order to measure the natural content of uh, uh, materials. Gustavo is the CEO of uh, Ars Tintoria, uh, a very specialized laboratory and also research center in the leather, uh, leather uh, field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, he is uh, also a uh, delegate of uh, Yulz and uh, of uh, uh, other several uh, technical commission, uh, national, Italian and international uh, commissions. And uh, today we are here to talk about um, this very interesting uh, study with, uh, with Gustavo and we can start uh, um, speaking uh, uh, about uh, um, bioeconomy and uh, bio-based material. Why actually bioeconomy is so important uh, um, element uh, of, uh, uh, for example, the Green New Deal, uh, the European Green New Deal uh, and uh, uh, for the decarbonization uh, uh, objectives. Yeah. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you. Oh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Well, uh, the concept of uh, bioeconomy was born in, in 2012 uh, in Europe. And uh, the concept is this, that all the materials, all the production that we need uh, should come from uh, bioeconomy, and that means from bio-based materials. So that everything should, should be born from renewable sources, and, and in this case, we, are, we need to, to study and to re-engineerize all the materials that we are going to produce, considering that we must begin from natural uh, sources, and this should be transformed in, the, um, in food, in, uh, in materials, in uh, any article, in, um, in, um, in uh, oil and, um, and gas, for example. So, uh, so all what we need as, uh, as energy, as uh, materials, as feed should come from natural sources. And well, the, the reason of our study is that uh, because of the concern that we have on plastics and, uh, and especially on the degradation pattern of plastics. The numbers are really incredible. So the, the production of uh, plastic residues is are 300 million tons per year. And this is a source from from United Nations. Uh, only 9% of plastic produced is recycled and about 12% is incinerated. The rest 29% is accumulated in landfills. And what happens with plastics? The problem is the, the degradation pattern. So the, the first image we have of plastics are in this moment these plastic islands that, uh, that we can find in the oceans. But that is the macro problem. It's what we can see. What normally we don't see or we see with more difficulty are microplastics and that is part of the degradation of these plastics. Then, uh, you know, as microplastics, we know that they, they generate intestinal flora disorders. Um, regarding uh, the liver, they, uh, they will generate uh, fatty acid uh, metabolism disorders and uh, oxidative stress, and even worse for nanoplastics, 
because they are generating on the intestines the inflammation and oxidative stress, but at uh, reproduction level and uh, as um, cellular reproduction uh, and, and brain level, it penetrates the, the blood-brain barrier, uh, the lipid barrier, uh, generating disorders, and at the end, in this way, it can accumulate in the brain, which means uh, at also it penetrates the skin. So it is very difficult to control, and there's not a lot of information about it. So uh, returning to the, to the Green Deal, um, the proposal of the European Union is to um, eliminate net greenhouse gases emissions by 2050. And uh, this means, first of all, carbon neutrality. So we cannot uh, generate additional carbon in the biosphere. Um, we must think on renewable energy and materials, and we must consider the reduction of petroleum derivatives. Why? Well, petroleum derivatives are also organic. They, they are natural because, you know, they were part of uh, dinosaurs of, and vegetation uh, of about 100, 150 million years old. But our biosphere uh, is not prepared for receiving so much carbon. So we are interfering with the natural equilibrium. And that is the concept. So bio-based means raw materials which are, uh, which are derived from biomass. But can we measure circularity? So what we need to do is to discriminate from things that are really practically the same. So we have carbon, which is coming from fossil sources, like petrol, like carbon. Also, we have carbon, which is coming from biomass. So carbon atoms are carbon atoms. What is the difference? Well. First of all, let's analyze what happens with, uh, in, in the environment with the CO2 balance uh, when we measure the intrinsic emission of CO2, in this case, in a synthetic material. So our raw material is petrol. This is transformed uh, by petrochemical producers in polymers. Polymers are used for making uh, all the, all the goods that, uh, that we need for everyday use. Then sooner or later, we need to discard them, we need to transform them. So one possibility is incineration, and we will see, most probably, is the, the best way to get rid of them. But this will generate atmospheric CO2, additional atmospheric CO2. As I said before, the carbon that was for 100 of millions of years below Earth now is in the atmosphere. The side effect also of plastics are micro and nanoplastics, which are coming for the everyday use, for the waste of any plastic material, and for its degradation. The other possibility is, OK, we recycle plastics, but we cannot avoid the generator generation of micro and nanoplastics. If we have synthetic clothes and we wash them and we are losing these microplastics, we cannot avoid that. Maybe we can filter, maybe we can try to stop them, but they will still be in the environment. But sooner or later, again, we have to get rid of these materials and uh, we, we will arrive to incineration or now I, I heard that there are, for example, certain biota, certain types of bacteria which are developing to eat and disaggregate plastic. But what happens with this? Well, plastic, if it is uh, digested by bacteria, will become CO2 and water and eventually methane. So we are not solving the problem yes. still. So biodegradation generates uh 
yeah. CO2. Also, uh, biodegradation generates CO2. So that is our balance. So we didn't took anything from nature, just we took carbon from, from the petrol, and 100% of our material will return a CO2. Now, if we consider an hypothetical case of 100% uh, bio-based material, then our raw material is atmospheric CO2, which by photosynthesis will be absorbed by, by plants and then will be transferred to the animals which are fed by, by, by these plants. Then we can use these plants or animals for our goods. In this case, it can, can be uh, leather, or cotton, wool, etc. We can make our goods in the eventual case that we need to destroy them by incineration. This will be the result. We return to the same quantity of CO2 that was at the beginning. So we can say that we have an intrinsic balance of CO2 absorbed from the atmosphere and returning to the atmosphere. And so we can say that uh, we, this is a carbon neutral material. How, Gustavo, we can use uh, this carbon measurement to, uh, to understand and to, um, to test materials in order to, uh, to measure the content of natural carbon? Well, uh, yes, we, we can use um, one, um, one very interesting uh, reaction that is coming from nature. And that is that uh, cosmic radiations, uh, when hitting the, the atoms of uh, nitrogen-14 in the atmosphere, will transform them in carbon-14. So this is what we call a cosmogenic carbon. So it, it was not originally carbon, it was nitrogen. But because of cosmic radiation, this carbon is transformed into this uh, nitrogen is transformed in, into carbon. Carbon-14 is, um, is radioactive. Uh, it will react with, uh, with oxygen in the atmosphere and became CO2, but CO2-14. That uh, will be absorbed by plants and then will enter in the life cycle. Finally, the, the animals that are going to be fed with these plants will receive this biomass, and we can say that there is a constant quantity of carbon-14 in all living beings, animals uh, or uh, plants. Then, at the end of the life of, of all uh, living beings, there will be a degradation of, uh, of C14, returning back to nitrogen-14. That takes about 5,730 years. And um, that is what we call the half-life, means that if we have any ancient material which contains 50% of the modern uh, carbon-14 on it, we can say it's 500, 730 years old. It has one fourth, means it's about 11,000 years old. For that reason, carbon-14 can be used for uh, historic uh, datation. So uh, we collaborate with the CNR and the National Institute of Op Opti Optics on the development of a new system for measuring carbon-14, which uh, hopefully will be affordable in the market. Uh, for the time, actually, we have to work with a machine called this, uh, this uh, accelerator that is really very costly, uh, consumes a lot of energy, but uh, this is a, a very interesting way to, to analyze it. The development was done by the team of Dr. Bartalini in Florence, and uh, as a laboratory, we cooperate with them on making the validation on different materials, which, uh, which goes from zero to 100% bio-based uh, carbon content. So, 
as an example, what we did is, okay, there are a lot of environmental claims on materials in the market, uh, but on these sorts, these shoes, which are called circular, coming from circular economy, sustainable, sustainable um, vegan, etc. But really, what is the petrol content on them? So we, we began with this example. This is a shoe that the, the producer from UK says that um, the they're, they use no leather, no feathers, no fur, no skins. And uh, um, this material is vegetarian. Result was 100% petrol derivate. Second example. Uh, here, uh, this material was PETA uh, approved vegan. Um, the, the upper is made in apple skin. And um, it says that the material is reproducing the aspect uh, and characteristics of leather. And um, it is processed from, uh, from apple um, skins, etc. But it is 75% petrol derivate. Another case, also here, it says that the material is circular because it contains 20% apple waste, and it was true. It was 26% apple waste. It was, in their claim is at least 20, and it's okay. But the rest, what is? 74% petrol derivates. So we're speaking of plastic, which contains natural fibers. Another example, this was also a, a bit amusing because it speaks of on the polymerization of apple peels and cores, something that technically is impossible, but it's a nice story to tell. And in this case, we found different materials. The first one uh, that was uh, this uh, silver material, it was very difficult for us to, um, to measure because um, the fibers were too long, so it was very difficult to take an homogeneous sample. I have to say that was around, in this case, 92% petrol derivate. Then the white one, 74% petrol, 70% for the black and the back, and the beige one, 67%. Okay, some, something better is here, but again, the dominant material is still petrol derivate. Then this uh, leather that was this shoe that was part of a project where um, you can see there is um, a lining made in uh, real leather, vegetable tanned, as it should be, in my opinion, because that is a natural antibacteric, is the best way that you can preserve the health of your feet. And uh, the upper that was done with the combination of natural and synthetic tannins. Synthetic tannins are petrol derivatives, and we know that. But uh, the, they say the, there was no scope of making 100%. Just to see, okay, what, what is this sort of leather that is a metal-free one? Well, we found that uh, just 12% in the lining and 16% on the upper. And this is, I have to say, without doing any effort on doing it better. Clearly, leather, collagen, is natural. If we use natural products for processing it, then, well, our, our material will be highly bio-based. Yes, probably, Gustavo, also the main difference uh, is that uh, the structure of, of leather is natural. So the collagen structure is, is, uh, is made by yeah. nature. And instead, in the other hmm? materials, uh, you need to construct, to create uh, a new structure in order to uh, to realize uh, a similar leather structure yeah. of, of a no, In fact, uh, that is the characteristic typical of leather. It has natural cohesion between fibers and has a sort of bundles of fibers which have a very high resistance. So in any material that you want, when you want to copy leather, you need to construct this, so you need to add 
polyurethane, for example, that is going to give higher strength, but and not always you will achieve the same results. So you have no, <laughs> you don't have a natural polymer, and you need to add clearly. Artificial but, uh, polymer. Yeah, in, in my in my test, I did different trials. The, when we made the validation against the accelerator, I took as a sample one piece of leather I have tanned for a museum following uh, a method of 300 years ago. So just vegetable tanning, natural fats. We measure it in the accelerator and in this system gave me 100.0% bio-based materials. And was beauty, was really nice as a piece of leather. If you need to do that with any other material, well, you have to work on it, and you have to construct this apple appear, uh, this leather appearance if you want to, to generate that from other, other materials, clearly. But there is something interesting also on this, and this is a plus that we will find on leather. And this, this magic molecule that <laughs> we find here in the center, that is hydroxyproline. Hydroxyproline is uh, an amino acid that is normal, naturally generated by plants as, uh, as a protection against environment, against stress. So in under stress conditions, under environmental change conditions, for example, the plants will generate hydroxyproline to preserve themselves. And uh, this is a biostimulant. It's a, it's a molecule that is very helpful for the growth of plants. So what if instead of burning our materials when we arrive to the end of life, we, we can extract the hydroxyproline and we make from it a fertilizer? So now we are cutting the generator of CO2 as much as we will be able to recycle this material. And then we will generate something that will help plants to absorb additional CO2 from the environment. So in this case, the intrinsic contribution will be positive. And that is something that should be diffused about the qualities of leather. No other materials have this property. We can eventually make a plastic um, compostable, but will not give enough nutrition to a plant. We cannot create uh, amino acids and proteins uh, yeah. from, uh, from plants. And that is natural on leather. Yeah. Hmm? With, yeah, clearly, we, we uh, always have to respect a balance of um, um, Yes. May, so the, the question, please. I'm sorry, the mm -hmm. question is, is that allowed? Because I learned that chrome tent leather is banned from composting for traceability issues. Mm -hmm. um, and as well for environmental issues, you don't want to have chrome necessarily in compost. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, are there limitations when we talk about leather composting? Um, and if yes, which are they? Because we know from zoology and wet white that would be okay as mm -hmm. well. Batch tent uh, leather, but then batch tent might take longer to biodegrade than um, mm -hmm. wet white leathers would. Yeah, well, first of all, regarding biodegradation, I think uh, leather is, has too much to give if we transform it in fertilizer instead of thinking that we are going to dispose of it. So for that reason, I don't recommend when we, when we are speaking on sustainability on think on degrading it naturally, okay? I know, yes. yes if I it, can add something, yeah. um, biodegradability is a very key point uh, if uh, we are talking about, uh, for example, one use uh, materials. So uh, we use only one time, I have to disposal. Mm. Uh, but uh, if uh, uh, also um, in 
in coherency with the, uh, with the European uh, uh, Circular Economy Action Plan. We are thinking about a durable material, so a material that can be reused uh, used for a more time and also can be circular. This, uh, uh, this characteristic, this feature is uh, preferable with respect to the disposal of, uh, of materials. I only want to, to add uh, one, one thing. Uh, this, uh, uh, this possibility, this treatment of uh, leather waste uh, is possible in depending on uh, the type of tannage, for example. Also, chrome tan leather can be and is be and is uh, transformed into fertilizer and biostimulators. This is already a reality today. We mm -hmm. are companies that uh, uh, recover leather and transform it uh, into proteins uh, and uh, amino acids mm -hmm. and, and so on. Yeah, re regarding uh, chrome, yes, clearly, if we have a full content of chrome, that is not good for the environment. Um, but um, again, you know, as uh, as she said, well, uh, you know, many many companies are already producing this, clearly separating chrome from from the the, the protein to be to make it simple, and uh, at this point we come we have a chrome-free hydroxyproline. In any case, uh, the, regarding the chrome content, as other oligo ailments, also they are needed for nature. You know, chrome. It is one of the um, of the ailments we need for our everyday lives. A small quantity, clearly, of chrome, not high percentages. But, um, for example, um, certain plants uh, can grow easily if they contain, at least in their in their in the earth, 40, 50 ppm of chrome. But the same for our metabolism. If we have enough chrome and that we can assume as chrome picolinate is a typical, um, how you call it, nutrition complement that we can, we can take. That helps, for example, to metabolize better all sugars, so all carbohydrates. So let's say there is a balance. So you, we cannot think on disposing leather as it is, but what is important is we have, to, we have ways that are already in the market where the leather can be transformed in something useful, can be upcycled, not only recycled. Yes, and I fully agree. There must be more lives before going into the land again. I yeah. fully agree. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, um, also in, uh, I, I don't know if you have uh, had the occasion to read, uh, for example, also the farm to fork strategy of the uh, EU. And, uh, uh, this uh, European strategy foresees a very important role uh, of uh, natural fertilizer and uh, bio, uh, biostimulants uh, in order to substitute uh, uh, chemical fertilizers uh, based on nitrogen and, and so on. And leather scraps uh, are identified as uh, one of uh, raw material for this, uh, for this uh, process. One question for my side, Gustavo. Yeah. Um, can we use uh, uh, radiocarbon uh, also for other uh, uh, applications, for example, to understand or to measure the natural content also of uh, chemistry or chemicals that we use uh, in tanning uh, in order to, um, to, to reach 100% uh, of natural uh, materials? Uh, yeah. Yes. and. Um not only, but uh, we, we have made studies on the application of radiocarbon quantification for chemicals for lot different, as we have seen, leathers and leather alternative materials, but also on textiles. Um, for example, with the polyesters, polyesters that, you know, can, they can be from natural sources or from petrol sources. With this system, you can say exactly which is the proportion or from which source it is coming. The same for, for, for feed. There are many essences, like can be vanillin, for example, which can be done from petrol derivates or can be done naturally. So with this system, you can verify if these, uh, these products are really natural as they are claimed to be. Thank you. Thank you. 
and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a question for the uh, fertilizer process. Is there right now a company, like are there major companies who are doing the fertilization process? Or is it like, uh, let's say, is there anything in plan um, for any other smaller companies who can, like if I have something smaller bags, I can just uh, give them uh, to make fertilization? Yeah, uh, uh, in industrial scale in Italy, there are at yeah. least five because we, we have at least three in Tuscany and, and two really big in, in uh, Arzignano and Vicenza. And some of them, are, they are even importing shavings from other countries, uh, from even from... Yes, uh, because from they have no enough materials not, not enough for in their order production. to produce, uh, yes. Because there is a, a very high demand uh, at uh, global level on... Uh, this natural uh, and um, organic fertilizer and uh, especially biostimulants because uh, as Gustavo said before uh, um, biostimulants are very, are very helpfully helpful for uh, um, for plants uh, especially for fruits plant because they um, don't need to uh, to work to create uh, their own proteins but they use the proteins already constructed uh, and available and so they can use uh, uh, photosynthesizer and uh, uh, solar energy in order to create uh, for example bigger fruits uh, or or so on uh, but right now we are talking about big factories who do this process yeah. are there like something planning for the next years in the small scales, like over Italy or over Europe, or like uh, those hotspots for recycling leather, like a smaller, uh, I don't yes. know. I, I don't know factories. about any project like this, but in my opinion, can be done because yes. the process is not so complicated, really. Yes, also, um, this reality also are working uh, and uh, are, uh, um, I know that uh, um, some industries uh, are uh, in uh, construction, for example, in Portugal or in the main, uh, uh, for example, footwear or leather street districts uh, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, um, I think that already, um, I, I know the situation in Italy, in Italy for example, because the, um, a, a, a big part of uh, uh, funds uh, that Italy received uh, uh, from the next generation EU, for example, will be uh, dedicated to uh, the recovery plans uh, and uh, a part of them uh, will be for uh, uh, leather from uh, leather goods uh, and uh, footwear, for example, uh, uh, to, in order to recover uh, uh, leather scraps uh, from these, uh, the leather chains. Thank you. Uh, I want just to, to clarify one point regarding my presentation, because uh, I spoke on the intrinsic contribution of the material. Okay? Uh, then when we speak of sustainability, so that is a, a bigger word, that will cover from, from, let's say, from the beginning to the end of, of the process. And clearly, um, we have to consider that we we'll need energy. So energy should be done with this concept. So, but in my opinion, if I have to define what is for me sustainability, is, is making our process in, uh, in groups of circular phases. So if we ensure the circularity of each of the processes, then we will get a sustainable process. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, okay, I just, um, my, my question was uh, on the business model that uh, these five companies have uh, in Italy. Yeah, about the, I mean, for a tannery, is it uh, more incentivated uh, to dispose uh, or to recycle, sorry, the scraps uh, uh, before the tanning? Uh, I mean, these companies, um, do you have to pay to bring the scraps? And is it more incentivated to 
to bring scraps that are not tanned yet uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, tanned scraps. This okay, there are there are companies that uh, uh, treat that treat only uh, pre-tanning uh, uh, scraps, uh, and they use uh, uh, they use them to produce uh, uh, fertilizer, but not only not only, for example, also uh, construction retardants and and so on. But there are also um, companies that uh, recover and uh, treat. Uh, um, leather finished scraps uh, or also uh, leather that come from uh, uh, leather goods uh, or, uh, or footwear. Of course, uh, um, they, uh, they make this treatment uh, for, for pay. So um, the, the company that need to dispose uh, this, uh, this weight uh, have to pay a fee to this, uh, to this company. But it's the same time, it's the same uh, thing uh, that uh, you have something that is uh, classified as waste uh, and you uh, have to, uh, to dispose it. So there is no difference uh, uh, from an, an economic point of view if you give scraps that are not tanned or, or you give scraps that are tanned? Huh? Okay, it, it depends uh, um, from... we. we uh, which point of view you consider the, the question? Um, if you, for example, you uh, you, uh, you need to realize uh, um, a finished leather, okay? You already know that uh, a part of this leather is unuseful for you, and so it's unuseful to tan all leather, for example, and so to add the energy, water, chemicals, and to arrive at the finish step and the last step and uh, at this step cut it and dispose the finished leather. But also from a production point of view is not uh, economical, uh, uh, is not sustainable also from the economical point of view. And also for the, uh, for the recovering, the process is more simple. It, requi it requires uh, uh, less energy if we uh, treat uh, uh, less chemical materials. Uh, I, I don't know if... Uh... I perfectly understand. The problem is that tanneries don't see the defects uh, before a certain step of the process. So even if this is, uh, of, of course, logical, they need to go up to a certain point of the process. So they cannot dispose, uh, uh, let's say, raw... Yes. They, they cannot cut uh, the leather at a raw stage, so they need to go up to a certain process. But I understand that the market is more uh, appealable, uh, appetible, I don't know. Yes, the, the process, the, the chemical process uh, um, is, is the same. It's uh, always uh, hydrolyzation of collagen. Yeah. Okay, this uh, hydrolyzation process uh, um, is uh, almost the same, okay. Uh, it, it needs uh, more, uh, more energy and uh, probably more time uh, if uh, we have a finished leather because we have to, um, to, to, to break, uh, also to break uh, chemical uh, molecules. But uh, on this point, uh, I, uh, I leave the floor to Yeah, I have to say another thing. You know, most of these companies that are present in Italy, they are specialized in a sort of leather. For example, one of them is just processing vegetable tan leather. Why this? Because they, they specialized one product which contains natural tannins and hydroxyproline. Because natural tannins are, for example, a very useful bactericide that is, let's say, um, it will destroy all the bad bacteria that you will have in the land. So this is making a certain synergy. Otherwise, other ones are, for example, uh, producing just wet blue. Others are working on the crust of, of, uh, of uh, chrome-tanned leather and so on. So they have different specializations because the best you can separate the different sorts of leather, then the, the best result you will achieve in the final product. Yes, this is, for example, uh, the reason why 
it's not so simple to recover chrome-free scraps, but not because uh, the chrome-free is uh, more resistant to uh, degradation or to hydrolyzation, for example, but because there are a very many types of metal free and each of it uh, have uh, one uh, have uh, its own characteristics uh, and we cannot uh, use the same process to recover all of them other questions okay thank you if you have uh, questions also <laughs> after you can uh, contact us uh, or, uh, yes, we are here. Thank you very much. Come on!